Well, hello everybody and welcome to the sky in July. Um, let's have a look at uh, the sun, first of all. That's what we start off with uh, uh, on these occasions. And the sun at the moment, again, is completely blank. Now, last time, you'll remember, there was a sunspot on there. And actually, this has been clear now for five days. Um, and that brings our 2020 total to 139 spotless days. That's 75% of all days have been without sunspots. And actually, when we last looked at this a month ago, that was 77%. So it does look as if Solar Cycle 25 is just beginning to kick off a little bit. Um, we're not expecting great things from Cycle 25. It's going to be something not unlike Solar Cycle 24, which is to say a lot smaller um, than the preceding couple of cycles. 22 and 23 were both quite big cycles. Um, but what we can expect, I think, from looking at back at the, the 11 years ago, it was 71%, and then, then it suddenly came down to 14 the year after. And perhaps we can expect similar um, for next year, and then um, a run with not very many uh, spotless days at all thereafter, and that's when you get the auroras um, coming far enough south to be seen from, from Ireland. Um, and uh, so maybe 2023 or so we'll start, we'll start to see some of the green stuff in the sky again. So that's, uh, that's the sun. Um, we're well into the noctilucent cloud season now. Um, and the only problem really has been not that there haven't been any displays. There have been some fine displays of noctilucent clouds. Um, but the weather during June has been really quite disappointing. We had a fantastic April and May. Um, during during lockdown, but unfortunately June hasn't lived up to the same sort of uh, standards. But it is still worth looking. There's still um, a good few weeks left um, to see these. Uh, they usually I've, I've seen them. I think to about the fourth of August is the latest I've seen them ever. And so look from the northwest to the northeast after after sunset and until dawn. Um, so that sky is now getting a bit darker. The the evenings really are drawing in a bit now. Um, after the after the solstice, or indeed the latest sunset, which was the twenty fourth of June, um, but uh, it is now getting a little bit darker at night. So well worth a look for the noctilucent clouds. That's some that I took on the evening of the twenty second of June. That was about uh, that was actually around about the local midnight, about half, half past one or so. Um, to now then, we've had some disappointments with comets so far. Um, this year we have we had one one big one break up that was promised to be very good um, a couple that didn't turn out um, quite as hoped because you know what they say about comets that uh, uh, they're the same as cats in that they have tails and do what they like and you never really can tell um, however we have one here comet neowise c2020 f3 uh, and it's been around the sun and showed up very nicely on the uh, on the Soho images as it was doing so. Um, fortunately, it doesn't seem to have broken up. Often the case with comets is that as they go closest to the sun, um, they, the heating effects build up pressures inside the comet and they break up. Um, doesn't seem to have happened with this one neowise because there are photographs of it coming out um, just before sunrise early in the morning. Now it's a sort of four o'clock in the morning kind of time or maybe even a bit earlier and this one this picture was taken by uh, Peter Horolek of the Czech Republic um, this morning um, the 4th of July and he reckons the magnitude is about plus one um, so that's that's pretty good if you get a, that in a dark sky that would be fantastic so um, it will be coming up between um, Gemini and Auriga um, in the in the coming nights, and so look to the northwest to see this. In fact, there's a chart here. Here we go. Um, yeah, so it's coming up here now. This is the fourth here, still quite close to the sun. Um, but then moving further away from the sun, up between um, Castor and Pollux and Capella, um, by about the ninth and tenth, and then in the coming nights, it's moving up to somewhere beneath the Plough. Um, towards the end of the month. Now, it remains to be seen, of course, how much of its brightness that that uh, manages to hang on to. Um, but that is the comet. So let's keep an eye out for that one. So now let's have a look at the moon um, at local midnight. That's that's one twenty four a.m. or thereabouts um, on the early morning of the 5th of July. Um, so what we've got here is an absolutely full moon. In fact, probably one of the fullest moons you'll ever see. 
um, for the reason that it is almost directly in line uh, between the sun and the earth, or, just, or behind the earth, in fact. Um, and the reason for that is that there is um, a partial penumbral eclipse slightly later that evening, about three o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, we won't see much of that from here. It's close to when the moon sets, and it's not a very good eclipse. But the one, one side of the moon may become slightly darker just as the moon passes into the very outer parts of the Earth's shadow. It does mean that we are seeing pretty much close to 100% of the moon at this point, though. Now, zooming out from that full moon, we can see that uh, just to um, the east of that moon, we have the two gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, both quite close to each other and both coming up to opposition on the 14th and 20th of the month, respectively. Um, so we'll be getting very good views of both planets and we'll look a little bit more closely at those now. So here's Jupiter at opposition on the 14th of July. Um, and uh, we have um, the four Galilean moons there. Um, the unlabeled one here, Ganymede, is just uh, emerging from behind Jupiter. And actually, at this time of year, it's very good for seeing um, transits and shadow transits of those moons moving in front of Jupiter. Um, we'll dig out some of those in a moment. But uh, this is Jupiter at opposition again at that local midnight time, 124. And if we zoom into the planet, we can see actually that we're just we're just losing the great red spot over the side there. Now, all of this being a gas giant, of course, this is all weather going on. So the the appearance of Jupiter is constantly changing, um, and um, it's great to sort of keep an eye on it all, and also to watch the the moons go round. Um, it is worth remembering when Galileo first discovered these moons, um, 1609. Or thereabouts, that was the first realization that actually not everything went around the earth. And indeed, um, Galileo found himself in a certain amount of trouble with the church and so on for uh, uh, suggesting that uh, this was a, d a demonstration of something else um, going around a different body than the earth. Um, of course, now we know much better and that uh, the solar system is actually really sun centric rather than earth centric. Um, and we see that uh, most of the planets do have other objects going around them. Um, this being Jupiter. So let's have a closer look. So I've reset the clock there to uh, a couple of hours earlier, 23, 24. And what we're going to do now, just um, animate Jupiter here so that we can see how uh, the moons actually move. And if I run this like that, that should, uh, I should get a fairly fast movement. We're sort of moving through the minutes. Now you see how the moons move and we'll run this um, throughout the the night just to go a little bit faster perhaps um, there we go yep and here comes Ganymede from out the other side and there we go and that's 322 in the morning we'll start getting light soon so that's the movement of Jupiter's moons which you can follow night by night by night as Galileo did and determined that they were in fact in orbit around Jupiter now this is an interesting one. This is um, on the 17th of July, just as Jupiter is rising, 21.30, so still plenty of light in the sky there. Um, but what starts to happen here is that Io and its shadow start to traverse in front of Jupiter. And you'll be able to see that um, through a good telescope. Um, let's just animate this to uh, see what happens here. Um, oops, if I make sure that's parked there and that can go there we go and here comes Io creeping across the face of Jupiter and as the sky gets darker and darker you see it better and better as well and uh, there we are so that's uh, that's it there that's Io um, Io an Io transit of Jupiter and with its shadow so that's well worth looking out for so here's another one um, this is on the evening of the 18th 2300 exactly um, so nice and early on, um, Jupiter will be in a reasonably dark sky because it's to the south then. And uh, that's an absolutely ideal time to see the great red spot here. Now that is a huge storm, much larger than the Earth, that's been raging for at least 300 years. And that's really only because we've been watching it for 300 years. Um, but it was probably even there before that. So uh, that's well worth looking at too, the great red spot, the, the main atmospheric feature on the huge atmosphere of Jupiter. 
And just a final look at Jupiter here. Um, this is a perhaps a better transit of Io and its shadow. Notice as we're past opposition by um, just uh, 12 days or so um, that the separation between Io and its shadow has become that much greater. Um, we'll animate this now. Let's have a go. There we go. There's Io and its shadow traveling across the face of Jupiter um, over the course of about two hours or so. Looking now at Saturn, um, here's Saturn at opposition again at that 124 local midnight on the 20th of July and uh, we can tell that Saturn is at opposition here by looking at the, the shadow of the body of Saturn on the rings, that is symmetrical. Now we do see quite a shadow, that reflects the fact that Saturn is somewhat below the ecliptic at the minute, which is why it's not very high in the sky and nor is Jupiter. Both planets are probably better seen from the southern hemisphere this, this time of uh, uh, where we are in, the, in their orbits. Um, but uh, that's Saturn with its ring structure looking very good. Now one thing that uh, I think Stellarium is probably not showing me here and I'll find another picture for, um, there is a thing called um, the Seeliger effect and that is that Saturn's rings become very much brighter at opposition than other times for the reason that each of the ice particles is actually covering its own shadow when, when they're at opposition. Similar effect to what you see here with the, um, the body on the rings. And um, uh, that's, it's interesting to see that. It, it is quite an obvious effect. Um, um, but I'll see if I can dig out a picture that, that does that. Now as regards the moons of Saturn, um, they're not uh, quite as neat um, in a line as um, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, but you can see some of them. Um, the most obvious one of course is Titan. Titan is, uh, is, is, is big and bright, uh, it's, it's actually about eighth magnitude, um, so not naked eye obviously, but um, any small telescope will show Titan. Um, as for the rest, um, I find you tend to need to put a camera on it and then um, turn up the exposure to the point that Saturn is actually burnt out. Then you can see Dione, Rhea, um, Tethys, Enceladus and Hyperion quite easily. I've managed to uh, get pictures of those before just with a webcam set up on, a, on an ordinary telescope. Um, so that's, uh, that's the moons of Saturn. Now here's um, a photograph, this is actually um, astronomy photograph of the day from June 2017 and this uh, was taken by various people actually including um, um, Damien Peach who we know of course um, and this is Saturn at opposition in 2017, June 2017 and this, this shows very well the Seeliger effect with the rings being much brighter than, than usual. Um, and this is because, of course, there partly, I think, there's no shadows between, behind each ice particle. So you're looking at those straight on. And, of course, um, and they probably sort of reflect back more light directly in the direction that it came from. Um, because we are looking at this from the same direction pretty much as where the sun is. Um, so that's a, a really good photograph of Saturn showing that Seeliger effect um, really well. Right now, for those who uh, enjoy getting up early in the morning, and um, I must admit I, I don't, but sometimes I have to, there's some, some nice little conjunctions going on at that time as well. Now this is 4 o'clock uh, in the morning on the 17th of July. We've got a nice um, alignment here between the thin crescent moon, Venus, which is also showing a thin crescent at the minute, um, having been around the other side of the sun and come out again. And um, and that's sort of those two bodies are in the Hyades star cluster here. This star is Aldebaran, um, Alpha Tauri, and uh, and these stars here are the Hyades star cluster, unrelated to Aldebaran itself, just in the same direction. Um, and they are all forming a nice little pattern um, across a small part of the sky um, at four o'clock on the morning of the seventeenth. Now, and looking forward. A little further, the 24th of the month, um, we do get an apparition, a morning apparition of Mercury. And here's the, uh, this has moved here, Venus has moved away from, uh, from Aldebaran in those few days there, but uh, Mercury is peeping above the horizon here. Now, um, towards the northeast, because that's where the sun rises at this time of year, and um, but very small, tiny, might be a quite tricky observation, that one, because it's pretty low. But uh, that's a rare chance to see Mercury. 
The International Space Station is undergoing a series of passes. Now, these times and uh, data and so on are are all for Belfast. If you're further south, then um, the good news is um, a bit higher, a bit brighter, and goes on for a bit longer. Um, but these summer passes of the ISS don't divide as um, as radically into morning and evening passes, but rather the two get mixed up. So it starts off as early morning passes. These are see, that's, that's you know three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Um, but then some of them, you know, go earlier. There's a, there's a midnight on the 13th of July, and then they come to get earlier. There's there's a minus 3.7. That's about as bright as it ever gets from here, and that's 1:41 on the 15th. Um, there are, you'll see, um, some nights there are as many as four passes visible. So that's passes of the International Space Station that continue right through July, um, right the way indeed through to the end of the month. The 30th is the last pass on there. Um, if you're further south, um, then you probably even get a couple more after that and higher and a bit brighter too. So that's the space station. So that's really all I have to say to you at the moment. Um, thank you for watching. Stay safe and keep looking up.